Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Coming up on Market to Market, an attack on a meatpacking giant exposes more vulnerabilities. A study reveals possible fallout from food production. The legal battle over California's livestock housing rules. And market analysis with John Roach, next. What's the most complex industry on earth? It's not genetics or meteorology or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, June 4 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. Like last year's hunt for a swimming pool, this year's elusive item is the worker. U.S. employers added 559,000 jobs in May, according to Friday's release by the Labor Department. The unemployment rate dropped three-tenths of a point to 5.8 percent. However, finding someone to fill any openings has proven challenging. The speed of the economic rebound has put hiring managers in scramble mode to assist returning customers or to fill orders. Producer sentiment dropped by those surveyed in Purdue University's CME Group Ag Economy Barometer. The reading was down 20 points on concerns over potential tax code changes and rising input costs. Creighton University's Mid-America Business Conditions Index stayed above growth neutral at 72.3, even as labor shortages and supply bottlenecks are restraining growth. Now, the biggest meat processing company in the world was slowed this week from a different challenge, a cyber attack. As JBS tried to get back online, the hack exposed the vulnerability of industry inside and outside of agriculture. Josh Bittner has the story. Okay, first it was oil, now it's agriculture. What's next? In Grand Island alone, that's 5,000 head each day. And the, the, the stores, the restaurants that they supply, that's their supplier. Early this week, nearby cattle futures plummeted to session lows following a Memorial Day cyber attack on the world's largest meat processing company. The electronic assault prompted Brazil-based JBS to temporarily close several of its U.S. and Australian operations. Attributed to a Russian criminal gang, the supply chain disruption came one month after a similar hack shut down the Colonial Pipeline, which delivers about 45 percent of the East Coast's fuel supply. They went after our gas and they went after our hot dogs. No one is out of bounds here. Everyone is in play in every single a uh, corporate executive needs to be convening their cybersecurity teams today to understand what their continuity plans are. Yeah. How are they going to recover from a hack? The growing list of ransomware attacks on U.S. businesses and infrastructure has government officials, current and former, on alert. The White House said Never. President Never. Biden would address the issue yeah. with Russian President Vladimir Putin in a summit in Geneva, Switzerland this month. We're not taking any options off the table in terms of how we may respond. Uh, we're in direct uh, touch with the Russians as well uh, to convey uh, our concerns uh, about these reports. Cattle futures rebounded, and it's been reported all domestic facilities owned by the country's second largest processor of beef, pork, and chicken were up and running by week's end. Academic experts estimate a one-day JBS shutdown cuts nearly one-quarter of the nation's beef processing capacity. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Agricultural practices are frequently put under a microscope. The inputs and outputs have to be factored into how we produce food and fiber. A recent study compares the emissions from production of items like carrots and beef as well as its geographical location. Peter Tubbs dives into the study. 
Several scientific studies have revealed that feeding the world comes with costs, one of which is deteriorating air quality. A white paper released in May by the University of Minnesota shows that of the 100,000 premature deaths in the U.S. each year from particulate matter, nearly 18,000 of them can be attributed directly to agriculture. And we also know that agriculture is a major contributor to reduced air quality. But what people haven't known is how individual foods or diets contribute to reduced air quality. So we set off to uh, fill in the gap of knowledge. The study used data from the Environmental Protection Agency and the United States Department of Agriculture to calculate emissions from agriculture on the county level based on both the types of crops and animals grown, as well as their proximity to the nearby population. The study looked at nearly 170 agricultural products and found that animal production was responsible for 80% of all agricultural particulate matter. Three different computer models arrived at similar results. Ammonia was estimated to be the largest source of atmospheric particulate matter from agriculture. So one thing that can be done in crop production is to uh, reduce the amount of ammonia that's released from nitrogen fertilization. The authors of the study believe consumers can drive a reduction in particulate production by changing their eating habits. We point out in the paper, well, you get most of the benefit uh, just by uh, either changing the, the type of animal products you're consuming or by consuming uh, a, a little less. So you can get you know, 80, 90 percent of the way there just by making those, I don't want to say subtle, but, but substantive changes in, in your diet. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association told the Washington Post the study was riddled with data gaps and the methodology was questionable. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. California's economy is the sixth largest in the world. The agricultural sector alone accounts for 2% of the state's revenue, about $47.1 billion. So when a major policy change is set to happen in the Golden State, the rest of the industry takes notice. A change to livestock housing rules under Proposition 12 is just months away from taking effect in California. Colleen bradford Krantz looks at the potential impact of Prop 12 in our cover story. Terry Walters expects the sow buildings in which he has partial ownership will have to be reconfigured to allow more space for each animal if a California statute known as Proposition 12 is implemented in six months. The Pipestone, Minnesota farmer doesn't think it will matter that he's not a resident of California. These regulations uh, set a precedent that a state now is going to mandate how we have to produce that product. And so if one state has one regulation and one state has another regulation, I only have one pig. I can't make my pig meet everybody's regulation. As of January 1st, 2022, the rules for food products sold in California require all egg-laying hens to be raised in a large pen setting with at least one square foot per bird. All calves raised for veal must be provided at least 43 square feet, and all sows must be raised in an area that is a minimum of 24 square feet. While the egg industry had already adjusted somewhat due to an earlier California statute, the impact would be newer to the hog industry and would require most typical sow stalls to be enlarged by about a third over the current average of 18 square feet. Packers will face the choice of either losing the significant California market, which consumes an estimated 15% of the nation's pork, or only buying from producers who comply. One study suggests that less than 4% of the nation's sow housing would be currently considered compliant. The National Pork Producers Council sent a letter to Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack last week asking for his help. It argued that California's Proposition 12 will lead to catastrophic costs for the nation's pork producers. California officials say the rule, first proposed by the Humane Society and approved by the state's voters in 2018 with 63 percent in favor, is simply the expression of their citizens' wishes. It is a law that passed by very popular vote, and our job is to implement it and ensure the integrity of the program that goes forward. 
Several national meat industry groups convinced the California law will affect farmers nationwide have been pursuing legal challenges to Proposition 12. They argue the statute violates the doctrine known as the Commerce Clause, which prohibits state legislation discriminating against interstate or international commerce. In an April appeals hearing in California federal court, lawyers for the National Pork Producers Council and California state government explained their respective stances. Uh, Proposition 12 controls only the sale of pork products in California, and so it is analogous to to Walsh. And, we, you know, that's the common thread. That states have always been permitted to exercise their sovereign power uh, over sales within the state. The result of that is that those immense costs, $3 million for just one of our declarants to conform to that, are going to be borne by every single market hog borne by that sow. They're going to be sold in Illinois and in Michigan and lots of other states where the consumers do not want to pay for California's preferences for sow housing. At least one agricultural policy expert is doubtful these challenges will succeed as a similar attempt failed when California passed Proposition 2 in 2008. That earlier statute, effective in 2015, required owners of California's egg-laying poultry, sows and calves raised for veal, to provide enough room for each animal to fully turn around and extend their limbs. It initially applied only to those animals raised in California, but when the state's legislature realized they were putting their own egg producers at a disadvantage, the statute was expanded to all eggs sold in the state. In response to Prop 2, um, some, some uh, attorneys general from, from some of the kind of big egg producing states tried the same thing to get the, the uh, Supreme Court to strike down Prop 2, uh, and the Supreme Court declined to do that. The reason kind of on their face that they said they wouldn't do it is because the attorneys general basically weren't egg farmers, uh, and so they didn't have kind of a right to criticize this law. I think in reality, that's sort of just trying to dodge the issue. Michigan State's Schaefer helped conduct a study that showed the older statute, Proposition 2, did increase egg costs across the country. The increased prices, he concluded, would hit the nation's lower-income consumers the hardest. The fallout from the measure also increased the speed of consolidation as some poultry farmers left the business rather than spend the money to rebuild their laying facilities. Schaefer expects Proposition 12 will do the same thing to the hog industry. He would prefer to see livestock housing changes come from economic pressure that starts in the grocery store rather than being directed by a single state's popular vote. If we care about animal welfare, I might be willing to pay more for um, animal welfare-friendly eggs or animal welfare-friendly uh, pork. Um, this is a different thing, right? Those people that said no now don't get the option um, to vote with their wallets anymore. And so uh, that is definitely going to negatively affect and, uh, and, and has negatively affected sort of the poor people who um, rely on kind of these staple proteins to feed their families. California Agriculture Secretary Ross would have preferred a legislative debate. Our proposition process, uh, you know, just really restricts that exchange of information and the kind of sometimes very detailed and precise scientific information that's hard to convey when it ends up being in a campaign that's about, you know, 30 second sound bites. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford Krantz. Next, the Market to Market Report. Technical trades around rainy, hot and dry weather impacted the commodity markets this week for the holiday-shortened trade week. July wheat gained 24 cents, while the nearby corn contract jumped 26 cents higher. The bulls appear to be leading the bears in the soy complex, as soy oil serves as the biggest influence in the pits. The July contract added 53 cents. July meal improved 70 cents per ton. December cotton rose by 256 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, July class three milk weakened by 13 cents. 
A mixed week in the livestock sector as August cattle shed 52 cents. August feeders dropped $1.42 and the July lean hog contract increased $1.25. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index added 11 ticks. July crude oil expanded 317 per barrel. COMEX gold decreased $10 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs commodity index gained more than five points to finish at two, I'm sorry, at 526.50. Now here to provide insight is senior market analyst John Roach. Hey, John. Hi, Paul. How are you? I'm all right. I uh, want to start with wheat and you were excited about wheat this week uh, from Rochag Marketing. Uh, these contracts, though, are very different because it's not across the board that each one of these is doing well. The southern crop, yes, has gotten rain. The northern crop, not so much. So what's happening as a whole in this complex? Well, the wheats are differentiating themselves, and the spring wheat uh, is in the area that's having difficulty uh, getting uh, uh, moisture, and, and uh, as a consequence, we've had uh, a very poorly rated crop there. Uh, and uh, uh, at the, on the other side, in winter wheat country, uh, we've actually had more than normal rainfall uh, through a lot of the of the winter wheat country. So we have winter wheat that's kind of dragging a little bit, uh, and a little worried about protein values out forward. And we have spring wheat that uh, pushed up to new highs today. Well, there is, uh, as I kind of alluded to a little bit in in the opening question, we have another question that came in. Uh, this one via Twitter from a viewer in Canada. And Canon Canada wants to know, with no real measurable rain in the forecast, is the drought in the Dakotas and the Canadian prairies factored into the prices already? Uh, the answer to that question is, it certainly is. Um, I didn't mention the Canadian um, uh, dry conditions. Uh, they're suffering as well. Uh, but that's something that the market is watching on a daily basis uh, and, uh, and probably driving the market more than anything else right now. Uh, what's the forecast and, and how will that impact the crop? Uh, and we come into this weekend with the hottest forecast we've had in some time and uh, not much rain. Um, and that uh, it's going to impact all the markets, but spring wheat is the crop that's been hurt the worst so far if you look at the ratings uh, that were given to us on Monday. So what do we do here if we're in this market, we're knee-deep in it, what are we doing? Well, there's only one way to bring home high prices. You actually have to sell them. Uh, we have um, a sell signal right now in spring wheat. Uh, and uh, we've, we've had it for two days. Uh, and uh, our recommendation is that uh, you be making some sales of uh, both the old crop, if you have old crop left, and an increment of new crop. Uh, think about another sell signal coming later on in the summer. Uh, this may be the peak or may not be the peak. It'll depend upon what the weather is and what the crops are really doing at that time and how the demand has been impacted. But we're selling into the strength uh, uh, in the spring wheat uh, at the end of this week. It was upper 90s in North Dakota at noon on Friday, uh, 96, 97, Bismarck, uh, Minot in that area. A week ago, it was ridiculously cold, so much so in the Dakotas, Minnesota, parts of Iowa. We had frost on the corn. Uh, a lot of the pictures have come in. It looks like corn has improved. Did, did corn dodge the bullet in a weather scare, and is that what moved the market early in the week? According to the crop ratings we saw on Monday, yes, corn uh, appeared to have dodged the bullet, although normally those reports are a little delayed because you can't tell how much damage was done by frost in one day or two days. It takes longer than that. But most people that we've talked to think that uh, the crop was in a small enough state that uh, although it was uh, uh, it was injured a little, uh, probably did not reduce yield substantially. All right, so with the near contract and the deferred in December, we're almost getting to the point these two were very close to alignment, but they were very different in how they responded. One up 4%, the other up 8%. Why is December continuing to rally like it is? 
Uh, we've already put a lot of premium into the old crop corn. Uh, July corn uh, uh, was much stronger and still is stronger uh, through um, through all of the higher price levels. And even when the prices decline, um, uh, the July corn uh, stayed above the December. Well, now uh, we're getting to the point where uh, July corn is about a done deal. And we're now focusing out on the new crop. Uh, elevators are focusing out on the new crop as well with their bid structures. And so... Uh, 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 we've had uh, strength come into the December relative to the July. And again, it's, it's mostly weather and, and we're getting through the end of the old crop. All right. So I'll ask the same question that I did in wheat. What do we do here? I mean, are, to sell is, is one option. Is that hold for corn? Get ready to sell. Uh, we're not quite at sell signals yet, uh, uh, although we are um, uh, we're cleaning close. We think we'll be there Monday, Tuesday. Just depends on whether how much follow through that we can get and what kind of weather forecast we have on Sunday uh, when we uh, start to trade the Sunday night markets. Uh, we think you sell into the strength here. Uh, uh, the weather. Uh, is usually traded into the market. We trade at least a week out, uh, if not two weeks. Now, there are some people that are saying there's going to be a ridge. This ridge is going to lock in here solid. Uh, there's some uh, cold o ocean temperatures off the West Coast, and that's going to move the jet stream around a little bit. And so there's, but there's others that completely disagree with that. Nobody expects much rain. Uh, and so it, we're dealing with dry. It's just a question of how dry and how long and whether it has a big impact on what yields uh, on the yields. At the moment, it hasn't had, but it sure can. And it's also the same story almost in soybeans too. It's exactly the same story with one exception, and that is the buying continues to be relatively strong in corn. We got export sales out today. We sold some more old crop corn. We didn't think we thought we'd see cancellations, actually. Uh, but the bean business has really gotten slow. Uh, that's all moved down to South America, and uh, we just haven't seen much bean business. And so uh, the um, uh, the bean market has not does not have that demand component that's working in favor of the corn market right now. Uh, I need to get into this JBS story and its impact on live cattle. Um, does this have a long tail impact in livestock, like say the fire at the Tyson facility in Kansas a couple of years ago? Or is this just a one, two week thing? Uh, we don't know the answer to that exactly, but we think it's just a one or two, a couple day thing. Uh, uh, the uh, slaughter numbers this week, I, as I recall, were down about 14% uh, on cattle and 19% on hogs. Uh, they'll make uh, maybe some of that up over the weekend, uh, uh, but uh, uh, we think they'll be operating uh, full steam here first part of the week. Uh, but what we are seeing is a concern uh, about the ability of somebody to come in and and uh, and take out uh, our oil business or the pipeline business, take out our our ability to uh, produce uh, uh, beef and, and pork. I mean, those are those are scary kind of things. And the scariest part for me as a business person is my government tells me that I've got to defend against that when I know that I'm fighting against the biggest people in the world, how's a small business or even a bigger business uh, such as JBS, how are we supposed to compete or fight against the most powerful nations in the world attacking us? Uh, I think that uh, we need the federal government to step up and to, uh, to help uh, industry uh, be able to fight off that kind of attack. The labor story that we talked about earlier in this broadcast, uh, there are employers that are uh, incentivizing workers to come back, bonuses, increasing wages. Is that what's going to maybe have to happen uh, to maybe level up some of this field of the packer margin? Possibly. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the main thing that's happened here is that the, that the demand for beef has been very strong and the packer has not been able to get enough animals. And so they've been able to really widen their margins. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, yeah, we need to have uh, uh, everybody back to work and, um, uh, in, in order to move the numbers through the system. All right. Through the feeders, uh, quickly, John, uh, are you expanding any herds right now if you're a feedlot operator? 
Uh, we're actually telling people to be careful in here. Uh, you know, these corn prices are high. Uh, feed prices are high. Feed prices are likely to stay high for a little while here. So you really have to understand your numbers and understand uh, if, what, what, uh, how you can make this all work at these higher feed costs. D that doesn't seem to be impacting the hog market, though. Well, the hog market is um, is off on a race. Uh, I mean, the market closed at new highs here today, uh, and uh, we have a sell signal. We're the seventh day of a sell signal on hogs, so we're selling into the late summer and the fall hogs. We don't want to go past that. We think these are good price levels. We think people need to be a little bit careful. Notice that the Chinese futures, pork futures today, were down 4.4%. Uh, the Chinese are struggling uh, uh, with uh, overweight hogs, uh, that have been held because they, they had losses in them. Now farmers there are starting to go ahead and move those hogs into the system. It's breaking their market uh, uh, quite aggressively. And um, uh, and so that remember, they have a lot more hogs than what we do. And so what happens there, uh, we can't ignore it. So when we're looking at, at very high price levels uh, here uh, and we're seeing them on a decline, uh, we think we need to follow our sell signals and get our margins protected. John's teasing ahead to the global discussion we'll have. We'll talk about China and Market Plus. John Roach, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Paul. Appreciate being on. That will do it for this installment of Market to Market. We will talk more in Market Plus, so you can join us there. Find that on our website of Market to Market. Dot org. And we've been in the Twitter camp sharing links to our stories for a long time, asking you questions and retweeting items of interest. Give us a follow at Market to Market. Next week, we look at some of the monumental impacts on Western stakeholders. Thanks for watching. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.